project, we created a project where we introduced the flip-flop component. And we used the flip-flop to toggle the state of the LED when the switch was released. But there was a problem. Not every push of the switch caused the LED to toggle. And that was happening because of a subject called mechanical bouncing. So I'm going to talk about what mechanical bouncing is and how we can fix it. So here's your expected switch behavior. You would expect that you push the button down, or the button is not pushed and it's low, and then here's where it toggles, where you push it down and you hold it, and there's a quick transition for the button to go from zero to one, but then once it's at one, it's relatively stable. That's, in the real world, that's actually not what happens when you push a, a physical button. Buttons are subjected to bouncing, and what that looks like is this. You'll push the button, you'll hold it down, but the contacts inside of the switch or the button actually touch and disconnect several times before becoming stable. And this is, this is a relatively short amount of time. This is usually in the hundreds of microseconds, maybe milliseconds range. So relatively short amount of time, but it does happen. And the FPGA is running so fast that it actually sees these glitches occurring inside of the code. So these glitches represent the bouncing of the switch. There is a point where after the, the switch glitches out a bunch, it does become stable again, but it, it does take some time. And so the purpose of this project is to filter out these glitches such that the LED works much more reliably where every time we push the button down, we get the LED to toggle its state. Now, if you think about what was happening inside the FPGA, each one of these falling edges of these glitches was toggling the state of the LED. But it was happening so fast that your eye didn't see it. So if the right number of falling edges occurred, the LED would actually toggle its state. It would toggle a bunch of times, and then it would end in the opposite state of where it started. But if the wrong number of glitches occurred in the debouncing part of the, the switch contacts, then the LED would turn on and off a bunch and end in the same state that it started in. And to the human eye, it just looks like it never turned on at all, even though it did turn on very, very quickly for, you know, maybe a couple hundred microseconds. The human eye actually can't see it. So the circuit, the code is still working when these glitches are occurring, but it's happening so fast that the, the, it's not even visible to the human eye. So we're going to fix that in this project. But the first thing we need to talk about is how to deal with time inside of an FPGA. So we know that the switch is glitching for some amount of time, and we're going to say, okay, well, let's, let's filter that out, uh, and we need, to, we need to talk about how we can do that. So time does not inherently exist inside of an FPGA. You, I've mentioned this in the past, but there's no way to just tell your FPGA to do something and then wait for a little while, wait for a millisecond, wait for a second. That's not possible. It's not built into the language. It's not built into your synthesis tools. You have to be a little bit clever with how you keep track of time inside of an FPGA. You need to keep track of it on your own. And the way we're going to keep track of time is by counting clock cycles. So again, a clock is, a clock is your main driving component for all your flip-flops in your design. And that's what we're going to be using to keep track of time. So let's discuss how that works. On the Go board, there is a 25 megahertz clock. So, how can we know, for example, when one millisecond passes? Well, the answer is, is that we can count clock cycles. We can create counters inside of an FPGA, and if we count the number of clock cycles that occur, we can actually get a reasonable, we, we can figure out how much time has, has passed. So, the Go board uses 25 megahertz. 25 megahertz is a 40 nanosecond period. And if we want to know how long one how many clock cycles are in one millisecond, we can take one millisecond, which is 0 0.001 seconds, and divide it by 40 nanoseconds and get 25,000 clock cycles. So if we have a counter that counts to 25,000 and then something happens, say a pulse gets set 
then we know how uh, that a millisecond has passed. So that's what we're going to be doing on this project. And here's the description. This project should add a debounce filter to the code from the previous project to ensure that a single press of the button toggles the LED. So what we're going to be doing is taking the code from the previous project, which I represented in this dashed box here, and simply adding a filter, a debounce switch filter, in front of, of that input to this project. So from the switch, when the switch closes, we're going to be getting the unfiltered version, which I showed on a previous slide, with all the glitches in it. We're going to send that through this debounce switch module, and the output of that is going to be the same switch, but it's going to be a filtered version without any of those glitches. And that's the goal of this project. That way, every single button press is going to toggle the LED correctly. For this project, I opened up the exact Verilog code that we did on the previous project. I'm going to get started with the Verilog code. If you want to skip ahead to the VHDL section, you can do that. And all we're going to be doing, for, we're going to be modifying the code we wrote previously to add in the debounce filter that we want to write. So I'm going to start with modifying the old code, and then we're going to go ahead and write the debounce filter itself. So the old code used iSwitch1 directly, and this is the glitchy iSwitch1 version before it's been filtered out. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to replace iSwitch1 with the filtered version. So let's do that first of all. And I'm going to call that wSwitch1. So I'm going to create something new here, wSwitch1 and iSwitch1 gets, re gets replaced, and now I'm going to say that anything called wSwitch1 is going to be now the filtered version. In order to do that, I need to define that particular signal, and I'm going to use the keyword wire. A wire in Verilog can be used outside of an always block. That's generally how wires are used, um, and they can either be assigned via the assign keyword or I'm going to use it in this way and I'll just show you how it's used. So w switch one uh, you cannot give a wire an initial condition whereas I can give initial conditions to reg regs. So I'm going to instantiate debounce filter here and the way this is the first time we have seen Verilog code where one module actually instantiates another module. So I haven't written the module that I'm going to instantiate yet, but I am going to instantiate it as, as if it exists. We'll show the actual creation of the module next. So I'm going to call it debounce switch. That's This name is going to have to match the module name of the filter that I'm going to be creating after this. I can give it any name I want now. This is where I give it a, a name. I'm going to call it instance. And I need to map all of the all of the inputs and outputs in the debounce switch module to signals that exist in this particular module in my clocked logic module. So uh, we haven't seen this yet, but I'm going to have three I'm going to have two inputs, i clock I'm going to have an input I switch, and I'm going to have an output O switch. I switch is the glitchy input, O switch is the filtered output of the debounce filter, and clock is the same exact clock that I'm using here. So on the left side, you, you, you have to do a period and then the signal name, open parentheses. And inside the parentheses, you should put in the, the name of the signal that exists in this particular level of this particular hierarchy. So iClock is the same name, iClock. Uh, here's one that's different. I switch in the debounce module gets mapped to I switch one at this module. And the output of the debounce switch is going to be W switch one. So the input is the glitchy version of the switch, I switch one, and that's the only time that's going to be used is the input to the debounce filter. And the output, W switch one, we've defined here, and we've used it here and here. 
So this module is now complete. I'm going to go show what debound switch looks like now. All right, I've gone ahead and created a new file called debounceswitch.v. And let's create the module for that, debounce switch. And it looks like I described previously, input I clock, input I switch, I switch, output O switch. Okay, now I'm gonna be creating a parameter. Parameter is a new keyword in Verilog that I'm introducing. And a parameter can be thought of as a constant, a value that is set once and not changed. So I'm gonna call it C underscore debounce limit. I name my constants or parameters C underscore to represent the fact that they're constants and I usually capitalize all of them except for the C. And I will set it to 250,000. And this represents 10 milliseconds at 25 megahertz. So the purpose of this is that you could have 250,000 sprinkled throughout your code, but it's easier and more clean if you just create a parameter or a constant once and then reference that parameter throughout your code. So it's recommended practice. It's done the same way in C and Java. It's just, it's just good practice to do. Next, always block, always at pause edge, I clock like we've been doing, begin, and, and now let's fill in this always block. So the question is, what is our debounce filter going to do? Well, I'm gonna write a line of code and then explain how it works. I think that's probably the easiest thing. So what this is, what I'm, what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to have, I'm going to be keeping track of the I switch, which is the glitchy switch value that we are sampling from the switch directly. And then I'm going to also be keeping track of a signal that I'm going to call R underscore state. R state is the filtered version of the switch. So we have the, un, we're, we're comparing the unfiltered version of the switch to the filtered version of the switch. And we're saying if the unfiltered version, if the input version is, is not equal to, this is not equal to, the filtered version, then we know that the switch is toggling. We don't, we, we, it's either gone from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0, but it's, it's in the state of transition right now. And we're also checking to see if this register R underscore count is less than our count limit. And if it is, we're just going to keep incrementing count our count gets our count plus one. This is the way that we create a counter in Verilog. Else if, now we're gonna check to see if our count has reached its limit. Our count double equals C debounce limit. Then we're going to do two things. First, if it's at its limit, we're going to have to reset it. So set it back to zero. Oops. And secondly, we're going to want to sample the current state of the switch. Our state gets I switch. Switch, that's how you spell that. Oh, one thing just to point out here. Uh, you don't need to use a begin and end around an if statement if there's only one line underneath the if statement. If there's more than one line, you do need to put begin and end around it. Else, our count goes to zero. So this is the extent of the always block, and I will just talk through this briefly because it might not be intuitive how this is working. But basically, if the current state of the switch is different from the filtered state of the switch, then we're going to be counting up. We're gonna count up for 10 milliseconds of time. And when we've reached 10 milliseconds of time, that's when this if statement happens. At that point, we sample just once, we sample the current state of the switch into the filtered version of the switch. So this effectively allows the filtered version to pass through the debounce filter and be, this R state is what we're gonna be using 
in the, in the higher level module, and I'll show how that gets passed. Otherwise, we're just going to keep the counter at zero. So the counter starts incrementing as soon as a change is detected on the input switch. Okay. And finally, we need to assign the output value of the filtered switch. So that's done with the keyword assign. O switch is our state and module. So now O switch is the filtered version of our debounce filter. But we have not yet defined what our count and our state are, so we do need to do that. So our state, oops, are they're both regs because they're assigned in in sequential always blocks. Our state equals one tick b zero reg, and now this is going to be different, and I'll show you what it is first, and then I'll explain it. Inside the brackets, I have written 17 colon 0, which means in English 17 down to 0. And what I've done here is I've created a multi-bit counter. It's Specifically, it's 18 bits wide. So this counter can count all the way from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 18, 18 zeros in a row to 18 ones in a row. So that means the highest value of this counter is 2 the, po the highest possible value of this counter is 2 to the 18th. 2 to the 18th is 262144. Now the reason I chose 18 bits for the R counter value is because I needed to choose enough bits to represent the debounce limit maximum. So in this case, my debounce limit was, was 250,000 clock cycles. So as long as I have enough bits to represent 250,000 clock cycles, I'm okay. So in this case, 2 to the 18th is 262144, so I, I have 12,000 extra, 12,144 extra available combinations that are just never going to be used because when our count hits the debounce limit, it gets reset to zero. So our count will count from zero to, to from zero all the way up to 250,000, and then boom, it'll get reset back to zero again. And that's okay, and that's fine. Uh, but the, And this is the way you, you generally keep track of counters. You have you define a multi-bit uh, reg and you count from zero to some limit and then at the when it gets to the limit you reset the counter. I will say that it's not obvious that this is the way you create a counter. You might think that the right way to create a counter would be to use a for loop. For uh, for you know r count equals zero r count is less than C D bounce limit R count plus plus. If you've ever taken a programming language, this is the way you generally write, you, you generally create a counter, right? This does not work. And I will tell you, as a blanket statement, just don't use for loops. For loops are part of the language, but at this point, you're a beginner in the language, and trust me that for loops are complicated and they don't be behave the way you think they might. So that's the way for loops work is definitely for a different project, but just for now, don't try to use them. They're not for you. So think about how a for loop might work in C and Java, and don't don't use the actual keyword for, but just use counters. And that's what I've done here. I've basically you know the same the functionality is similar to the way a for loop might work, but I don't use the key, the word for to do it. So figure out a way to solve the problem you're trying to solve without using a for loop for now. Okay. That's the extent of the code. I'm going to be moving on to the VHDL section. All right, for the VHDL section of the code here, I've used the exact same file from the previous project where we were having the problems where the LED wasn't always toggling when you push the button down. And all I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be instantiating the debounce filter, and I'm going to be replacing the output of the debounce filter I'm sorry, I'm going to be taking the output of the debounce filter and replacing this iSwitch1 with the filtered version of the debounce filter, which I'm going to call WSwitch1. So for now, I'm just going to do a little replacement here of iSwitch1 for WSwitch1. And I'll show you how that works. So I'm going to instantiate debounce filter. 
and I'll just show you show you how this works first and then explain the code. Debounce inst, give it a name. In this case, you can call it whatever you want. This is the name of the instantiation. And next is colon entity work dot debounce switch. So entity followed by work dot debounce switch. Debounce switch is going to be the name of the entity that I'm going to be creating. This is my debounce filter. And by default, every it resides in work. Uh, this is the library work. Port map port map oh, Emacs wants to help me. I don't want help. I clock. So this is anything on the left side of a port map is the formal and the right side is the actual signal names. So what that means is this is the left side is the signals inside of debounce this debounce switch module and this is creating a map between the signals inside debounce switch to the signals inside this module. In this case, it's called clocked logic. So the, for the case of I clock, the two signals have the exact same name and that's totally fine, but they're different for the next signal, which is I switch on the debounce filter. But in this, at this level, it's called I switch one. And O switch will be mapped to W switch one. So W switch one is the signal that I created down here, which is the filtered version. So the output of the debound switch is, is the filtered version of the, of the switch. So now you have, you can see how you've instantiated this module here. And the nice thing about doing module instantiation like this is now every time you want to create a debounce filter for any one of the switches on the go board, you can simply instantiate this debounce switch module. You don't need to go through the effort of creating all the code inside this module again. So this is how you, you can see how complicated designs can be built up uh, through levels of hierarchy. And that's what makes great code is when you have a really clean hierarchy. For the last thing we need to do here is actually define the signal. So W switch one, standard logic, and there's no initialization on this. I should explain that when I use R underscore, I know that the signal name is going to be assigned in a clocked process. And I know that it's gonna be turned into a register. When I use W underscore, I know that it's gonna be assigned outside of a process. So I could do something like this. W switch one, you know, gets I switch not I switch one that would be fine. This is not creating a register. This is this is creating a lookup table, Boolean algebra equation. Alternatively, I can do what I did here, where the output of the debounce switch module just is connected to a wire. This doesn't actually create a register at this level. There might be a register down inside the debounce switch module, but at this level, it's just a wire between two points. It's just a wire from from this point here to this point here. So I call it W underscore. It's, it's actually part of Verilog. Verilog makes you make a distinction between registers and wires. VHDL doesn't make you make that distinction, but I really like the fact that Verilog makes you make that distinction because it helps to keep the code clean. I know that if I see W underscore being assigned inside of a clocked process, something's wrong. I've made a mistake. And alternatively, if I see R underscore being assigned outside of a clocked process, I've made a mistake there as well. So it just, for me, it really helps keep the code clean. Um, it's the way I like to do things. That should do it for this module. Now we do need to create the low level module, the debounce switch. So I'm gonna do that next. All right, I've created a new project, debounce switch.vhd. Let's get started filling up the internals of that guy. Library, IEEE. IEEE standard logic 1164.all. And now I'm going to be using a new package. So IEEE dot numeric STD. Each package basically gives you more access into more features of the language. Standard logic 1164 gives you things like standard the, the standard logic types. 
numeric standard allows you to do math operations is the main thing that it allows. So in this case, I'm going to be using it because there's going to be a counter inside this module that counts the number of clock cycles. And in order to, cre to create a, a counter inside of your code, you need to use numeric STD. I will say one thing quickly here. Oftentimes, you might see code use, that use standard logic arith dot all. Do not do this. Standard logic arith is, although it's it, although you, it looks like it's an IEEE supported package, it's not a, it's not an official IEEE package, and it's not part of the VHDL spec. And in general, you really shouldn't use this. Numeric STD is the preferred one. So if you see code using standard logic arith, I recommend avoiding it. I have more to say on that topic, but for another video. Entity debounce switch is we're going to be creating i clock as an input the second input is i switch and there's going to be one output all right close off the entity declaration there Next, the architecture, the guts. I'm going to call it RTL. And Emacs is nice again and has given me some, some automatic code. Now, I'm going to introduce a new VHDL keyword here called constant. And I'm going to give it a name, C debounce limit. Type is integer. Ooh, you can do this. And the value is 250,000. This represents 10 milliseconds at 25 megahertz. This is the reason I created this constant is because constants help to keep your code clean. If you you could very well sprinkle these numbers, the actual hard numbers throughout your code, and it would work fine. But the problem is, is if you forget to change one, it, it tends to make your code ugly. Plus, if you give it a nice clean name like C, like C underscore debounce limit, you know exactly what the number represents. So I definitely recommend using constants. They're used often for the same reason in C and Java software languages. So it, it definitely is recommended. And I, this is personal preference, I precede my constants with a C underscore just so that I know it's a constant and then the constant itself is uppercase. The way I like to do things. And let's see, so I, I'm going to create two signals here. Signal, the first one is going to be R state. The type is going to be standard logic and I'm going to initialize it to zero. This is going to represent the filtered version of iSwitch. This is going to be what's driving the output O switch. I'll show you how. And the second signal is R count. The type is integer. And this is new. I'm going to set a range on this integer. Zero to C D bounce limit. And I'm going to initialize it to zero. What this is doing is it's going to be creating, what synthesis is going to be creating is it's going to be creating a multi-bit, a multi-bit signal uh, where the number of bits that it needs to create this register is going to be enough such that the integer can go from zero to this number here. So I'll, I will show you that in this case, the, the question is how many bits do you need to represent 250,000, a, a, a register that can count up to 250,000? And the answer I will just tell you is 18 bits. 2 to the 18th is 262144. So as long as the number is larger than the value that you're going to be counting to, you know that you have enough bits to count to that number. Okay? So our count, when the synthesis tools are, going to, are done with it, is going to be creating an 18-bit register that's going to hold the count value that the debounce filter is going to be using. Let's see what that looks like. Process. It's going to be a sequential process. I'm going to call it 
p underscore debounce, let's say. Uh, Emacs, Emacs. Okay. Sensitivity list here. This process is sensitive just to the clock. So whenever the clock changes from zero to one or from one to zero, we want this process to be executed. But we really don't want to look at the transitions from one to zero. So let's just say if rising edge high clock. And again, this is 99% of the processes are gonna look exactly like this. All right, so I'm gonna write a piece of code, uh, an if statement that's gonna look a little confusing. So let me write it first and then I'll explain what it's doing. Okay, so if I switch, which is your input value here, this is the raw unfiltered switch, switch. If that's not equal to, that's the slash equal sign, that means not equal. If that's not equal to the current state or the filtered version and the counter is less than the limit, then we're gonna be incrementing a counter. Otherwise, if, else if, this is how an else if is done in, in VHDL, ELSIF, uh, weird, but that's the way it works. Else if r count equals c debounce limit, then I want to sample or register the input switch value, and I want to reset the counter. Else keep the counter at zero. This looks a little convoluted, so let me explain what's going on here. If the input switch is not the same as the output filtered value of the switch, then we're gonna to wanna to go ahead and count up. Once the counter has reached 10 milliseconds, in this case, or we'll see debounce limit, which represents 10 milliseconds, then we say, okay, the current value of the switch has been different from the old value of the switch for 10 milliseconds of time, therefore it's stable. So this, this effectively is filtering out all those glitches. Every time the switch is, is equal to the same value again, this is not true, this is not true, so the counter gets reset. If the switches have, not, have been different from each other for 10 whole milliseconds, then the counter has incremented to its limit and we say, okay, the switch is stable, go ahead and sample it and reset the counter. Think about that for a little while. It's a little bit confusing, but that's, that's generally the, the way you want to do this type of stuff. You might be thinking to yourself, well, gosh, a for loop might make a lot of sense here rather than using this crazy counter thing. And I will tell you that for loops do exist in the VHDL language, but don't ever use them. They're an advanced concept and they really don't work the way you think they do. So think to yourself, how can I solve this problem without using a for loop? Let's say you're writing something in C or Java. How can I solve this problem without using a for loop and then do that in VHDL? For loops are for another project in the future when you are much more comfortable with the language. We do need to assign the output value of the switch, the filtered version, and that's just going to be taking on the R state, the R state value. So that's it, we should be done. So now we have our debounce switch module, which again, we can instantiate throughout the design whenever we need a nice debounce filter. Now we're gonna be building the design and showing how it works. Okay, I've gone ahead and added the debounce switch filter into our design files, and we also have clock logic. This is gonna be the top level still of the design, and here we're instantiating the debounce switch. This is the Verilog code, but the VHDL looks similar. And we're gonna run through synthesis. Shouldn't take more than a few seconds. Synthesis is done. So we can look at the output report for synthesis, scroll down to the bottom, and see usage report for clocked logic. This is the top of the design, and there's some primitives here, and this is the interesting part here. Register bits not including IOs, 21. 
So we've used 21 registers now. So at least 18 of those we know are in that one, one counter. So that's where the majority of those represent. And there's some other ones additionally represented in there as well. There's one clock in the design, neat. And there's 31 lookup tables in the design. And, and the majority of these are probably being used to implement that, that counter, I would, I would imagine. So that's it. So now we've, we've used some more resources of the design. We're starting to, well, we're still really low on the resource utilization, but you're starting to see how counters and things like that can make a heavier, heavier impact than just Boolean, simple Boolean algebra equations. So let's continue with the build flow and program the FPGA and see what we got. All right, the FPGA has been programmed, the code is running, and now when I hit switch one, boom. Consistently, D1 is toggling when I hit the button. So the filter, the debounce filter has been working. We filtered out those glitches on the mechanical switch, and you've learned a little bit about how to count and how to instantiate modules. Boy, we've been busy. Making great progress. The next project is going to make use of the seven segment displays on the Go board, which are fun. So let's get started with that.